can be dismissed downstairs to Children's Church at this time, if you would like. And uh, I see some, uh, I don't want to see any gray hairs trying to pretend that they fit in Children's Church. No, you're stuck with me for the sermon. <laughs> All right, if you have a Bible, go to book, the book of James. Uh, maybe you have an app on your phone you'd like to use. That's perfectly acceptable as well. Um, or there are some pew Bibles there that you're welcome to use or um, take if, as a gift if you don't have one. We have been walking through the book of James for a few weeks now, and we are in verses 9 through 11 this morning. James 1, verses 9 through 11 this morning. Well, how many of you have been shocked at the prices of groceries and gasoline and everything? It seems like the uh, inflation and the economic downturn or however they're defining recessions these days have hit us all at some point or another. Um, and depending on how you're spread out and divided. It's hit everyone in some way. Um, and the next section in our study in James deals with how we would respond to financial trials. And, um, and as we've been talking, the theme in the first chapter of James is talking about our perspective in trials and how our perspective in trials really makes a huge difference of whether we just try to go through trials, which we all will and have and will in the future. Um, and we've, every, every human is either coming out of a trial, in the midst of a trial, or getting ready to go into a trial. And our perspective makes the difference of whether we just go through it or whether we grow through it, whether it makes us bitter or makes us better. And James addresses that to his church in the first few verses that they need to have the right type of thinking about trials. And then because we are humans, we don't have that perspective and that type of thinking. We need wisdom, and so we're to pray not just to get out of trials or to God to remove the trial or to go back in time and change the trial, but for us to have wisdom in trial, in the trials and how we're asking. And now he shows us this right perspective, what that's going to look like when the, that perspective affects our real world issues in our trials. And perhaps, as I mentioned this, as we gave some introductory remarks to the book of James, what were the trials that these dispersed, scattered in the diaspora, the, the scattered abroad Christians, what were the trials that they were facing? Of course, James says various kinds or diverse trials, um, but probably the two that they were dealing with was persecution and poverty. And so if poverty being one, that would lend itself to this in keeping in the broader context here of chapter 1. So one of the big ideas that James has is that we are, as believers in Jesus, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to have a wholehearted commitment that is consistent and uncompromising. And our problem in, in ourselves and in all of our churches is that we often are half-hearted in our faith towards Christ. And so one of the main areas that is not touched by our faith in Christ is in how we view the possessions that we might have. And it's not an accident that one of the main areas that we face trials in is in that area. It's a challenge to each of us and in our wholehearted commitment to Christ. And so this is a short paragraph with two major issues here. And so let's read it. And as we go to the text, remember this is, this is it. This is what we... Set, this is the authority. This is God, his inspired, inerrant word. So this is what we submit to. And so let's read this carefully. And we've already recited together the first four verses. I'll begin in verse five then. This is God's word. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, 
that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything of the Lord. He is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we need you. We trust and believe that the Spirit of God is working in and with the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. So we know you are here and you are working and you will use your Word. Lord, we ask that you would accomplish the purpose for which you've sent this to in this day, in this context. Lord, I pray that you would let this text speak. Lord, I pray that you would draw souls to yourself through it, that you would edify your church, that you would renew minds through this portion of your word today. Lord, I pray that we would all be more like Jesus for how we would submit and conform to this text. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the overview of this paragraph for our purposes this morning will be this. We're going to look at two Christians, and that's an important interpretation that I'm believing that this is two believing um, believers. Two Christians, two different economic situations with one trial and the same solution, okay? So two Christians, two economic situations, one trial and the same solution. That'll be our message this morning. So in this text, we see a challenge to both the rich and the poor. Um, but what is it related to? In the context, as I mentioned before, it brings this idea of trials. So it says there, verse 9, let the lowly brother, or the brother of low degree, and one thing we want to make sure is that we don't miss what's there. <clears throat> I'm reminded um, that sometimes in Bible study, we need to observe the obvious. It's kind of like in science, or maybe you're looking at the geese as they've been flying. Uh, I was watching soccer games yesterday and saw these geese fly over, and they're flying in this V. And um, do you know why one side of the V is shorter than the other side of the V when they fly in that formation? Because there are more geese on that side. <laughs> We're going to the deep things here this morning. No, what do we do? We, we automatically start thinking about how one's I almost said one's breaking wind. Um, how one is like cutting the wind so that the others can fly and they get into formation so it makes it easier for them to do that. And, and, and we jump to those details. Rather, right? Just the obvious that's there is, oh, there's more geese on that side, so it's longer and this side's shorter in that V. Sometimes when we come to the Bible, we just gotta like let the plain things be the main things, right? So it says, let the lowly brother, this is a Christian. What is a brother. A brother is someone, a man or woman, a brother, a believer. This describes someone, a man or woman, whosoever will that would belong to the family of God through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 and verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he authority or power to become the sons of of God. That offer is available to you today. That that to become a brother and sister, that you are invited to believe, and the only way that you come into this family is not by natural birth, because all of our natural birth was terrible. We are sinners by birth and by choice, for, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The way we come into this family is by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ alone. There's no mediator between God and man, only one, Christ. He, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you are here and you don't get anything else, that's it. You are invited to not miss that. Let the 
brother, that you can be part of that brotherhood, that sisterhood, to be a brother or sister by belief in Jesus Christ. How does one become a Christian? By repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Let this lowly brother boast in his exaltation. This brother, this describes the person that the ones come to this family. The same word is paired with an orphan or widow. These, so these humble circumstances, and then the rich, and it says of the other, and it says, and the rich, verse 10, and it's that, the, the, that noun is implied that the brother, the rich brother, would be implied here of his low position. So, <clears throat> why does James bring up money when talking about a wholeness and a commitment to Jesus Christ in response to trials? So if what we're supposed to be learning is about how we're to be wholehearted commitment, committed to Jesus and have this divine perspective that he's working it together, that he is bringing about, and we're to consider it joy when we go through these trials because God in his sovereignty gives us this opportunity for him to work about and, and bring about gains, no pain, no gain, and to bring about like that, that, that sea turtle to, to struggle on the thing, to build us up, and as we follow the wisdom of the moon like the sea turtle does, that we're following this, as he uses that, if we're, how, why would he bring up money when it comes to this? Money and the things that money provides often have an incredible lure for us to compromise in our heart, in our commitment to Christ. We can't believe God that he is God if we have other gods in our lives and we need a reality check in fact none of us would say we've made our 401k or our our IRA or our bank account or our house our idol uh, but but we often would have things and whatever we find an idol is anything that we find beauty and security in outside of God we, we love and appreciate and are grateful for the wonderful gifts of God. They make wonderful gifts. They make terrible gods. Um, they, they are gifts, and we're to follow the ray of the sun back to the source and the giver. And so God often uses trials to wean us off and, rem and show us what we are finding security and beauty and safety in. They might not be bad things in and of themselves, but if we're finding our security and safety and beauty in things besides God, he often uses trials to bring us more into a wholehearted commitment to him. Our money tells a big story about ourselves. In fact, Randy Alcorn said it this way. He says, you can't divorce your faith from your finances, that they are connected and just like it did in the story of Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He stood up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that day, and he said, you know, Zacchaeus, come down from going to your house today. Well, the story ends with Jesus judges the reality of Zacchaeus' salvation. In Luke 19, he judges his repentance. He evaluates Zacchaeus' repentance by this, when Jesus calls this first fruit of his repentance in Luke 3, he says that he, he offers to go back and pay back those he has basically robbed or exploited with excess taxes. Um, he says in Luke 19, he's going to go pay back four times. There's a connection there. The rich young ruler in Matthew 19 and Mark 10 and Luke 18 he comes to Jesus and about what you know, he's kept. All, I've kept all the commandments. I've done it all. And Jesus, knowing in his heart, says, go sell what you have and give to the poor. Because Jesus put that point on there that, hey, you are finding satisfaction and safety in the covetousness of your own heart. And the scripture tells us he went away because he had great possessions. The rich young ruler. Jesus did not know um, Jesus, if, if that had been us and this guy comes, hey, I want to follow you, Jesus. Jesus doesn't like just close the deal and make the sale, become one of my disciples. Um, he, Jesus knew that this guy was coming to him with a divided heart. Um, 
Alcorn goes on to say, there is a powerful relationship between your true spiritual condition and the attitude and actions concerning money and possessions. We see this in Acts 19, the occultists in Ephesus. Their conversion is demonstrated by their willingness to burn their magic books. The early Christians in Acts 2, they sell their possessions and have things. I do this up freely. This is not some type of socialism or Marxism. They do this voluntarily of their own possessions, so personal property, voluntary giving. Um, they, they do this here. These early Christians do this. Uh, this is the natural response of these first century Christians. So our, our, here's a few other quotes here from Al, Ron, Randy Alcorn, which I'd encourage you, his book, Money, Possessions, and Eternity, and The Treasure Principle, two great books I'd recommend to you. Um, he says, our use of money and possessions is a decisive statement of our eternal values, that the key to right use of money and possessions is a right perspective, an eternal perspective. The everyday choices I make regarding money and possessions are, have eternal consequences. So James wants us to evaluate our circumstances, not economically, but theologically. He wants us to learn how to view stuff when times are tough. And so the idea is that we must look towards our spiritual identity as our reality and rather than our financial identity reality that we might have today. So he applies this in two ways to two different Christians in two different economic circumstances. The first is to the poor, the brother, the lowly brother. The first, this historically, at this time, there really wasn't much of a middle class, so there's a more of a dichotomy of either rich or poor. And so for us, many of us, this, the, there are implications of both of these that would apply to both of us on both ends. So it says, of the humble, the one, the, the humble one, the lowly brother, is to let him, or to, he should boast or exalt in his exaltation or his high position. Now what is his high position? There's a future high position to see of where he's future going to be, his final glorified state, free from want and pain. As we look into the revelation, and one day we're free from all that. And I think there is truth to that position. But also the current high position to look at what you are in Christ, seated with Christ in heavenly places and to, the classic passage that we let all of Scripture speak to us here would be Ephesians 1. Would you go with me to Ephesians? Ephesians 1. Um, just to look in Ephesians 1 of what it says you are in Christ. Let's just walk through that. What you are in Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 2. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. If you are in Christ, you are blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Verse 3. You are blessed. Your high position is that you are blessed in heavenly places. Even as he, verse 4, chose us in him. You are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. You're chosen so that you should be holy and blameless before him in love. Verse 5, what are you? You're blessed, you're chosen, you are predestined for adoption unto himself. Predestined to adoption. I'm not writing this, I'm just reading it, okay? Um, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has blessed us in the beloved. So we're blessed, we're chosen, we're predestined. In him we have redemption through his blood. So we're redeemed. We're redeemed. The forgiveness of sins, we're forgiven. Trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in wisdom, making known to us the mystery of the will, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. So, so we, we can see that we're, we're blessed, we're redeemed, we're predestined, we're chosen, we are lavished, we have, he, he reveals, he has, um, obtain, we have an inheritance that he's given to us, so that 
We who are the first of, to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him also, you, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed and were sealed. You're sealed. What are you? You're, you're, having, you're sealed with the promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession to the praise of his glory. You see it later on in the same verse 20 when it says later on there, it says, he that works, raised him from that, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. We're in this exalted high position in Christ. So if you don't have stuff, if your stuff is diminished, boast, exalt in your high position. Think of what you are in Christ. In, in Christ, you are adopted into God's family. You are a son and daughter. And all the possessions of this are with you it's spiritually and awaiting you in glorification. You have a rich dad. Okay? You have all of this wealth. So if you are in a trial of economic deprivation, take this divine and long-term look at who you really are are do you really know who you are in christ that this identity in christ this is what we're to look at we're to exalt who are you in christ i would encourage you to go to this text go to ephesians and bask in this what am i in christ and let that be your identity don't listen to your heart and your inside let the let the, the scriptures and God tell you who you are in Christ. So if you don't have a lot of possessions or the type of possessions you want or your economics are not, you're, you're on the poor side of that. Don't take pride in your wealth or the lack thereof take pride in the wealth you have in your identity in Christ. Look past the worldly situation and take pride in this high position. It actually says to boast. Let this lowly brother boast. I thought we're not supposed to brag. It's not always wrong. It depends on what you're bragging in. Notice he's not saying that, you're to, that, that being poor is the problem. Being poor is not the problem. Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. Christians, no matter what circumstance you're in, you can brag on your high position of what you are in Christ. All of his riches. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his grace, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You have riches in his grace. Notice that James's message is not, if you follow this wisdom and go through trials, you will become rich. What James is saying is that the wisdom that is from above will help you look at where you are from a biblical perspective, and you will realize that you are rich in Christ. It's all about perspective. So we were to boast in this. You say, okay, that's one passage where we're supposed to boast in this. Okay, I'll give you another one. Let's go Old Testament. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, just in case you're wondering who's talking, okay? Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory or boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast or glory in his might nor let the rich man glory or boast in his riches but let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me I am the Lord exercising loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these I delight says the Lord we're to boast in that we know Christ that we know God so by faith Christians are to look beyond this realm into the next. Paul would tell us in Philippians 3, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed into his glorious body. 
This is the challenge he gives to those who are in a poor economic situation. And then we come to verse 10. And the rich. Again, I say I believe this is a rich believer. This is a type of trial too. And some of you are saying, I really want to, try, I really want to go through that trial, right, of being rich. I mean, that's got to be really tough, right? Um, no. <clears throat> the problem, the trial that we face of stuff is that we think we own things, but in reality, things own us. Randy Alcorn calls this the tyranny of things. Ecclesiastes talks about this in Ecclesiastes 5. There's a couple famous guys that you've probably heard of. I'll read a few quotes from them about the trial of having wealth. Vanderbilt. He said that the care of $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. John Jacob Astor, I am the most, most miserable man on the earth. John D. Rockefeller, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Andrew Carnegie, millionaires seldom smile. Henry Ford, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. It's all about our perspective. Well, you might say, well, I don't have to read this verse 10 here because I'm not rich. I mean, he's sitting in the balcony, right? That's a joke for you guys that are here. Um, <laughs> sorry, Rich. Um, <laughs> um, who is the rich here? Was the rich one, the rich believer. I already mentioned that. The one that is rich, a rich believer. This is ri now notice he says, this is not synonymous which, with saying the wicked. He's not saying the wicked. So this text is not saying that there's the, the problem is that he has money um, with, as compared to the being poor. We shouldn't look at it that way. The Bible does tell us that riches are prone to pride and tend to exploit. And as we see in Timothy how, how, how that a lot of problems come from the love of money and that unhealthy lust of money. But also the scriptures tell us that the rich are able to be redeemed. They are encouraged to honor God with their wealth. That, that God is actually for profit. We see this in Exodus. I mean, in, in the implications, and it's work, I'm, uh, one of the things, uh, in my, the devotional that, that I'm reading right now, going through Exodus, when God gives the prohibition, thou shalt not steal, he's actually holding forth that there is personal property and ownership. And he actually gives other, in, 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 the, in the law there, to help the, the encouraging people to seek profit and seek to gain and do make as much as you can in in honorable ways. Work towards that. We see this in Job and Solomon and David. God is pro-prophet. All these type of people come to Jesus. Matthew and Zacchaeus. We just talked about this. These are wealthy men who are involved in economic work that come to Jesus. We see Simon the Zealot. James is implying that in this community, these scattered abroad Christians, that some of them are very well off. And many of us, whether we like to admit it or not, would probably fall into this category. We like to think, well, I'm not rich, this doesn't apply to me. But most of us think of ourselves as poor when we're really not. I just want to help us put ourselves in perspective. Um, even if, it, if we mean, even if you get your means through a government program, most of us are wealthier than 80% of the world. In fact, in Matthew 11, it gives a test to tell if people are rich or not. Can you, when you just fill your clothes, just fill your the sleeves. Is it soft or rough? If you have soft clothes on, according to Matthew 11, you're rich. Um, that you're not wearing some type of burlap type thing right now that you had to make out of um, uh, an animal. Um, if you have food in your refrigerator and clothes on your back and a roof over your head, you are richer than 75% of the world. 
Now, you can talk all you want about the 2% in politics, but if you have money in your wallet or your purse and spare change in a dish somewhere or in an ashtray in your car, you are in the top 8% in the world. So to the rich, he says, to the rich one is to boast, implied again, the lowly boast in exaltation, the rich to boast in his humiliation. To boast in your humble position. So you are a slave to Christ. You, th that is this identification with Jesus rather than the social position, the identity that comes with wealth, but your identity that comes in Christ Identity that comes in Christ is in the world's estimation humble. What? Right. Oh, so and so is a multimillionaire. Wow. Oh, so and so is a Christian, and he's oh, wow. Well, oh, it, it. There, there's a humility that comes in there. Rightly recognize that your identity is in Jesus. This is what we are. If you're rich, so poor, find your identity in Jesus. Rich, find your identity in Jesus. And he gives an illustration, and he gives a story about that illustration in verse 11. The rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Whatever accolades, wealth, or status have on this earth, we should recognize as a flower of the field. Now, flower of the field, this is a wild flower. It will pass away. The wealth, the status, the accolades that wealth brings are short-lived. The glory of human wealth is short-lived. So if you have human wealth and stuff, Realize that that doesn't give you real security. Christ does. Wealth and social status are transitory. So take pride in your low position. Don't boast in your social status. Don't boast in that. Don't find your security and safety and, and, and security in stuff or insurance. These are wonderful benefits, but they are poor God's fine take security take boast in your identity in Jesus the love of money those that would desire to be rich in first Timothy speaks of this we're actually supposed to 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 think upon this and and to face this with our Heart. Would you go with me to 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to get gains or your gains this year or lack of gains this year? <laughs> godliness with contentment. If you have a walk with God, a relationship with God that produces a contentment in your heart, now that's when you got something. You've got a gain there. Verse 7 of 1 Timothy 6, For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. I've yet to see in real life the U-Haul connected to the hearst. Verse 8, But if you have food and clothing... With these will we be content. But those who desire to be rich, those who desire to be rich will fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Remember, it's not the money that's the root. It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving. It's a craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. All of our stuff is temporary. The illustration, the verse 11 that James uses is this, how this wildflower, this flower of the field dies. It goes away, it withers, and it is gone. It fades away. 
Um, little boys love their mamas, right? And mamas love their little boys. And when we used to, our, our yard at our house we had before we came here, we had dandelion problems. And there was this little boy that would often bring picked dandelions to his mama, and she loved them. In fact, she would have little cups in the kitchen with these dandelions, and she would put them in her hair sometimes because her little boy brought her dandelions. You remember this, Draper? Okay. And, uh, and his mom, like, oh, she would just be glowing when she got these dandelions from. But guess what? We don't have any of them anymore. They're all gone. They're out there. Verse 11 backs up this warning by reminding us that the transitory nature of all human wealth and status. With a timeless description, this wildflower, an illustration, a short-lived human glory, status, and wealth. Life is transient, short, it's fragile. The scorching heat dries it up. Riches and pursuits, they'll all not win with it, but when they all will fl- fade away this illustration this is this annual death of ve- vegetation as a metaphor for this that they all perishes it all fades away but in contrast the scriptures tell us the voice says cry out Isaiah 40 what shall we cry all flesh is grass all its lovingness is like a flower of the field the grass withers the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it surely the people are grass the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our Lord will stand forever Proverbs uh, um, Proverbs for as man his days are like grass as a flower of the field he flourishes and the wind passes over it's gone it place remembers it no more psalm 49 do not be afraid when one becomes rich when the glory of his house is increased for when he dies he shall carry nothing away his glory shall descend after him stuff will pass away like the leaves of wildflowers matthew 24 heaven and earth will pass away but my words will by no means pass away The rich man will fade away as he goes about his business. Vegetation dies, grass dies. The rich will die in the midst of those business undertakings as verse 11 ends, in the midst of those pursuits. And the principle for us is that we should not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust will corrupt and where thieves will break through and steal. The idea... Andy Alcorn uses this illustration as if you have Confederate money and you're at the end of the mid-1860s and you know it's going, you need to get rid of that money because it is Confederate and it's going away. And the principle is that what we have on this earth, it's going away someday. Um, Proverbs 23, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, the wealth, it is gone. It suddenly sprouts wings and flies like an eagle towards heaven. So when Jesus tells us to store up treasures on earth, he's not saying because wealth on earth might be lost. He's saying it because it will be lost one day. Either it leaves us while we live or we leave it when we die. Uh, Either way, it's not taken with us. They asked John Rockefeller's accountant how much he left. You know what the accountant said? All of it. So Jesus tells us to think long-term with our investments. He told us where it would last, where it would be protected. Jesus wasn't against self-interest in this way. Lay up for yourselves treasure, but make, do it where it's going to last. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on before you. So this, this trial, two men, two Christians, two economic situations, same solution as we conclude. The passage addresses two types of Christians and how they view stuff when times are tough. Both are exhorted to look towards their spiritual identity as their reality, as the significance. Both are to see their current temporary status from God's perspective. So if you're poor... Don't let the world look down on down their nose and judge you. 
like you're not educated or skilled or you're some you know weirdo clinging to your guns and religion or something like that take pride glory boast in the exalted spiritual riches you have in Christ but if you are rich don't fall to the temptation to think a lot of yourself to enjoy to the esteem you have in society or find insurance or security in your wealth remember that there's really no such thing as ultimate financial security there's no true insurance for in an ultimate sense those things will fade and die like the leaves of those wildflowers take pride however and boast that you have the humble status of the child of the one who was despised and rejected of men. Christians should always look and evaluate their situation from the spiritual perspective, not the material, and have this be our reality. And this is so countercultural to our world. Our stuff drives people's hearts and and, but from a Christian perspective, we know that my wholehearted commitment needs to be Christ and the stuff is temporary. Or as Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He will, he will hate the one and love the other or he will devote, be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon or money. So when you're going through trials, you need to see all of it from the perspective of eternity. We need to see our circumstances, not economically, but theologically. Have the right perspective, the real perspective, the ultimate perspective, the divine perspective. So in the midst of financial trials, we are to take a long look at who we are in Jesus and how short-lived human wealth is. James 1, verses 1 through 11 has an application for every Christian. How do you respond when you go through trials? I tend to complain. Um, and it tells us to consider it all joy. Why? Because we know something that under the sovereignty of God, this trial that you're going through is bringing about a maturing process that God has, and then he says again to let that have its, that steadfastness have its whole work, that we're to let it have its work, we're not to shortchange it, that we have to respond to it well for it to, to get the, gain the benefits of it. Trials don't automatically make us have godly character. It's the right response to those trials. And then how can we do this? I, how do we do that? Well, we need wisdom. It's where to pray to if anyone lacks wisdom, we're to ask of God, and he wants to give it to us. And then he brings us this so that we can have this consistent commitment to Jesus. And so as we think about what James is telling us, it should renew our sense of selfishness, and, but also the sufficiency of Jesus and who we are in Jesus. And so we can put our trust in Christ and who we are in him if we're following him, uh, that he gets all of us, everything. He's our God. Let's have our possessions be in perspective of what we are in Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Before we pray, I just want to give us an opportunity to respond. So maybe in your seat, you just need to one of those two things recognize the same solution is to look upon Jesus who you are be reminded of who you are in Christ would you do that right now as you're praying Father, we thank you for the truth of this text, Lord, that no matter what our circumstances are with possessions and wealth, that we're to look at it from your perspective, that we're to glory in 